The basic guideline for the emergency departments in the U.S. is that anyone coming in with acute symptoms between the mandible and the umbilicus gets at least an ECG within the initial 10 minutes and then troponin testing. Menopausal hormone therapy did not prevent incident or recurrent disease and therefore was not indicated for the primary or secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease. And this is why I say that as we advocate for the improvement in women's cardiovascular outcomes, there are really four steps. The first is investigate, do the clinical research. The second is educate, as we're doing now, education of the providers and education of women. The third is advocate, and these are the advocacy organizations. And the fourth is legislate. And we have done this legislation in the U.S., and I expect we will see the outcomes. Good afternoon. Let me first congratulate the organizers of the meeting. A very auspicious meeting, the 20th scientific session occurring at 2020. So to choose the topic of heart disease in women, I think is, auspe is really quite auspicious, and we owe them a gratitude for this, and I'd appreciate a hand of thanks. Now, what I want to do is to review with you the data from the United States, and I expect you have similar data from the Indian subcontinent. These are my disclosures, and I don't expect that they interfere with my presentation. But let me give you a theme for what I'm going to talk about. And this comes from a statement of Victor Hugo, obviously in a very different context. But he said there is nothing as powerful as an idea whose time has come. And let me tell you about this idea. This is a favorite cartoon of mine. Look at the date, it's 1991. And we hear the clinician saying to his patient, we have studies of fruit flies, mice, hamsters, froggies, and monkeys, and men with this condition. But medical research using women as subjects just never occurred to anybody. Well, fortunately, since 1991, there has been a change, and I will show you the results in the US. This was the depiction of cardiovascular mortality, the men in the solid line, the women in the dotted line. And you will see that in the past century, in the US, cardiovascular mortality declined in men, but there was no change in women. And beginning in the year 2000, once we began to get data on women from clinical trials, in this slide, the men are in the blue, the women are in the red, and you will see that there was a sharp decline in cardiovascular mortality in women once we began to address sex-specific cardiac issues. And actually, in the year 2014, for the first time since these data were collected, the fewer women than men in the United States died for cardiovascular disease. And as I've said previously, we are delighted to be in second place and we hope to stay there. Let me tell you what cardiovascular disease was like early on. This is from the 1960s in the United States. And this was the first report of a conference of the Heart Association on coronary heart disease in women. And what was it entitled? It was entitled Hearts and Husbands. And the women who attended were told how to reduce the risk of heart attack in their husbands. And then in the American Heart Association, when the prudent diet was first presented to the American public. What was it called? The way to a man's heart. Essentially, heart disease was considered a man's disease, and the role of women in this landscape was simply to protect their husbands, their fathers, 
their male siblings and their male children from heart disease. And this is the public education. This is the year 1977. And Dr. Harriet Dustin and I did the first of the television presentations about heart attack in women. I don't know whether you can see the small print there, but it was 11 p.m. We were the late night show at that time. And now here we are in the middle of the day with a two-day conference. What I want to do is to show you how this has evolved, because once you see this, you will appreciate how far we have come. In 1992, not that long ago, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute had the initial conference on cardiovascular health and disease in women. And it was emphasized there. It was my privilege to serve as co-chair for this meeting. And we addressed that it was a flawed assumption that women didn't experience heart disease until they were elderly. We showed they did not. And that it wasn't as serious as for men. What we did was we highlighted the new information that was appropriate for clinical application, and obviously we presented a research agenda. This appeared in the New England Journal in 1993, and this was the first published paper in a major journal on coronary disease in women. Fast forward to 2001, and this is the Institute of Medicine in the US, and it had a unique challenge. It explored the biologic contributions to human health. And the question was, does sex matter? And our Institute of Medicine concluded that there was a need to evaluate sex-based differences in human disease and medical research, and importantly, to translate these differences into clinical practice. Then we began to get randomized trial data, and this fits in beautifully with what has just been presented. The first early trials we had were of menopausal hormone therapy, because in the US, and incidentally, in the US, we can't not call it hormone replacement therapy. We have to call it menopausal hormone therapy because the doses are not replacement doses. But we had the first randomized trials. The reason was that most clinicians thought that hormones protected women from heart disease, intrinsic hormones premenopausally, and menopausal hormone therapy after menopause. And hormone therapy was considered to solve all problems for women, from wrinkles through dementia. And now we had, not observational studies, but randomized trials. It was my privilege to be involved with both of these. The heart and estrogen replacement trial in women with established disease and the Women's Health Initiative in ostensibly healthy women. And what we found to summarize it, menopausal hormone therapy did not prevent incident or recurrent disease and therefore was not indicated for the primary or secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease. Now this was enormously important because what it did is to focus attention on established cardiovascular preventive therapies for women and not rely, as was done by clinicians previously, on menopausal hormone therapy. Then from our Agents for Healthcare Quality and Research, not that long ago, 2003, a report on the diagnosis and treatment of coronary disease in women. It was a state-of-the-art report, and it reviewed most of the relevant research. And what it told us was that in 2003, most of the contemporary recommendations for prevention, for testing, for treatment in women was extrapolated from studies conducted predominantly in middle-aged men and virtually exclusively in middle-aged Caucasian men. And they said we had fundamental knowledge gaps regarding biology, clinical manifestations, and optimal management strategies for women. And again, this dis really defined a research agenda for our National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. I want to emphasize advocacy because we've not talked about that yet. And I think this is enormously important. In 2004, our Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute instituted the Heart Truth Campaign, 
and the same year the American Heart Association's Go Red for Women. And I know you have a strong Go Red for Women program here in India. And this is an enormously important program for women. And this has the red dress now as the symbol of heart disease in women. And in the US, we also have another very important group, Women at Heart, which is a national coalition for women with heart disease. Again, an educational and support group. And advocacy is extremely important. And I'll come back to that in a moment. Then we had the Women's Health Study. Again, back on what we just discussed a few minutes ago. And this was a study in uh, women showing that aspirin prevented stroke, but not incident myocardial infarction in women younger than age 65. And it was totally different from the physician's health study in men that showed that in men, aspirin uh, provided MI protection, but not stroke protection. And remember that in both of these studies, the dosage of aspirin that was used was 100 milligrams every other day, which was then the standard preventive therapy. Then we began to get registry data. And this was a quality improvement registry on women with non-ST elevation acute coronary syndrome. And it taught us a great deal. It taught us that the acute coronary syndrome prognosis was worse in women. Women had an excess of hospital death infarction, heart failure, stroke, transfusion. This transfusion goes back to the bleeding issues we discussed earlier this afternoon. And that the women were less likely to receive coronary interventions and guideline-based medical therapy despite their high-risk status. And the question was, was the worst prognosis related to their raised baseline risk or the fact that they received suboptimal admission and discharge therapies. And what I reported in an editorial was, was this biology or bias? And I think it was a combination of both. Then again, a paradigm shifting trial. We mentioned this earlier, and that is the NHLBI's Women's Ischemia Syndrome Evaluation Study, the WISE trial. And in order to get into the WISE trial, the women had to have myocardial ischemia demonstrated at non-invasive testing. They were hospitalized, and they all had coronary arteriography. And surprise, many of these women did not have obstructive disease of their epicardial coronary arteries. And as I said, at that time, everyone would have said false positive non-invasive tests. But these women were in a study. And because they were in a study, they were followed. And it was found that if they had myocardial ischemia, even in the absence of obstructive disease of the epicardial coronary arteries, they had hard events, myocardial infarction and coronary death. And this was a study that established the importance both of microvascular disease in women and of non-obstructive coronary disease in women. This, this is very recent. This is just a few years ago. And this is why these are on the areas of research frontiers. Then we have the databases that give us information. And this is the Heart Association's Get With the Guidelines coronary database. And what Hane Janae had found is that in the Get With the Guidelines database, women had an increased mortality with STEMI almost twice the mortality for men. But that mortality was predominantly in the initial 24 hours. And during that initial 24 hours, they received less early aspirin, less beta blockers, less reperfusion, and less timely reperfusion. Now, this was not physicians saying, I'm not going to treat my women patients as well as the men. This was an unrecognized STEMI. It was just missed until later and the life-saving therapies were not given. And this gave us the opportunities to decrease gender disparities in care and improve clinical outcomes. And now the basic guideline for the emergency departments in the US is that anyone coming in with acute symptoms between the mandible and the umbilicus gets at least 
an ECG within the initial 10 minutes, and then troponin testing. So we are not missing these STEMIs because we say this is a young woman. She's unlikely to have myocardial infarction as the cause of her chest pain. Now we're back to the Institute of Medicine, and now just a decade ago, this is just 2010, this was a report on women's health research, progress, pitfalls, and promise. And as you've heard, I've said that medical research historically neglected the health needs of women. The sex differences are the biologic differences, and the gender differences are affected by broader social, environmental, and community factors. And what the Institute of Medicine said is we've done well in reducing cardiovascular mortality, but we need more research on quality of life issues, functionality, function being the major one, and mobility and wellness. But what it also did was showed us that there were major disparities in di disease burden among subgroups of women. And this is what I expect you should be doing here in India as well. Because in the US, we said there were disparities in women who were socially disadvantaged by race, by ethnicity, by income and education, and that we needed to target the highest risk women among the women. Then what the Institute of Medicine told us is that the lack of analysis and the reporting of sex stratified analyses limit the ability to identify important sex and gender differences, including differences in care, and it challenged us as journal editors to require that clinical trial outcomes be presented separately for women and for men. And for those of you who have recently submitted papers, I think you will see the journal editors now require it. They asked for translation of women's health research into clinical practice and public health, and here we're doing this at a two-day conference. An important, effective communication of research-based health messages to women, to the public, to the providers, and the policymakers. And I hope that the organizers of the conference will work with the media and see that the messages of this conference are now transmitted to the media as well. Then we began to get some women's prevention guidelines. And the first women's prevention update was in 2011. And this, for the first time, identified what we talked about earlier, that pregnancy complications, particularly preeclampsia, gestational diabetes, pregnancy-induced hypertension, are early indicators of cardiovascular risk. It is not, I believe, that these complications produce the risk but that these high-risk pregnancies share risk factors with cardiovascular disease. The message I want you to take away is that a detailed history of pregnancy complications is a routine component to risk assess women. And sadly, the obstetrical history and the rest of the medical history is often kept separate and I tell my women patients to bring their obstetrical history to their primary care providers and their cardiologists to be sure that it's incorporated. And again, we identified the increased cardiovascular risk with the systemic autoimmune collagen vascular disease. But very important now, in the US, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology now has a required therapeutic intervention for women at high risk of preeclampsia, and they get low-dose aspirin all through the pregnancy as a way of preventing preeclampsia. What it does for cardiovascular disease, we have yet to find out, but there's very important emphasis, and the U.S. Uh, regulatory agencies require that blood pressure be measured on every obstetrical visit rather than once or twice, as was previously done. Now, you all know the classical story of Sisyphus, who kept pushing that boulder up the mountain only to have it roll back again. And for years, that was the story with cardiovascular disease in women. And I'll show you where we've gotten some recent help in the US. And the first challenge is clinical trials. The women were underrepresented in our NIH clinical trials. And even when they were there, there wasn't any gender-specific analysis. Even though the representation of women has increased over time, 
only 20% of the ACS study population are women. And therefore, physicians are a little bit concerned in interpreting those data because they're not as powerful as all the data for men. In the Cochrane reviews, and those are probably some of the best reviews of cardiovascular, all cardiovascular clinical trials, only a third of them examined the outcomes by sex, and the ones that did sex-based analysis, 20%, one in five, reported significant difference in outcomes. And there's another concern that I want to share with you, and that's when we exclude elderly patients for clinical trials. And early on, there was an upper age limit of 65 or 70. That doubly disadvantages women, because women have a predominance of their coronary events, coronary disease, atrial fibrillation, heart failure at older age. But now in the US, we have legislation. Previously, we had guidelines, we had recommendations. And as well you know, if there are guidelines or recommendations, people can accept them or reject them as they choose. But now this is legislation from the Congress. 2015, just five years ago, mandate by our Government Accountability Office to update reports on women and minority inclusion in medical research, both at the NIH and at our drug regulatory group, the FDA. The NIH was mandated to ensure, this is in the basic research area, that both male and female cells, tissues, and animals be included in basic research. Five years ago, if you asked the basic researcher the provenance of the cells or tissues, was it a male or a female animal, they didn't know. And women's diseases will likely be inve being investigated in male tissues and in male cells. And disaggregate the results by sex and sex differences, and then update the guidelines on inclusion of women and minorities in clinical trials. And now when I submit a grant request for National Institutes of Health, I have to have a provision of what I will do to include women and minorities in the trials and a plan as to what I do if that doesn't occur. Otherwise, that trial will not even receive consideration. So this is legislation. And the Food and Drug Administration has to ensure that the clinical trials have sufficient evidence to determine safety and effectiveness for both women and men. Now this is important because in the US, I'm not sure how your drug regulatory agency works, but the companies will go to the FDA and say, if we have this protocol and these are the results, is it likely that you're going to approve the drug? So the FDA weighs in early on on protocol design. And now they will tell the companies that if there are not a sufficient number of women and minorities, you will have an exclusionary labeling on that drug. Now, again, this only happened five years ago. It will be a few years until we see what the differences are, but I think there will be differences. And this is why I say that as we advocate for the improvement in women's cardiovascular outcomes, there are really four steps. The first is investigate, do the clinical research. The second is educate, as we're doing now, education of the providers and education of women. The third is advocate, and these are the advocacy organizations. And the fourth is legislate, and we have done this legislation in the US, and I expect we will see the outcomes. But I think what we have to do now, and this is not legislated, this is my view. We have to expand the landscape of women's cardiovascular health research because women's cardiovascular health is not solely a medical issue. And we have to do research that regards beliefs and behaviors, community issues, economic issues, environmental issues, ethical issues. We haven't even addressed that at this meeting yet. Legislative and political, public policy, societal, and sociocultural. And this is why I expect it is so important to explore gender differences in cardiovascular disease. And I thank you for your attention.
Thank you, Nanit. Uh, can I ask you a couple of questions? Of course. Uh, now, you know, you talked about the uh, women and the cardiac cardiovascular disease. Now, can I ask you, what is the status of the women in the cardiology as cardiologists and as interventional cardiologists? That is on the other side of the table. Are there the number of interventional cardiologists, same as that of the interventional cardiologists, male we, interventional cardiologists? We, we are not doing as well as we should in the US. And the women representation in cardiology is very low. It's one of the lowest of all of the cardiovascular specialists. And the women who do intervention and structural uh, heart disease are very few. The women cardiovascular surgeons are few and far between. Uh, we have to do better. But I have to tell you, my institution has done well. And a year ago in March, we had the first female all TAVR team so that our cardiovascular surgeon, our structural and interventionalist, the echocardiographer, uh, and all of the people in, in the cath lab, everyone involved there was a woman. This was a first, we have a picture of it, and we are very proud of it. But I think this was the exception. We must do better. We must teach women in the US that cardiology is a female-friendly specialty. We've not done it as well as we should. And we're going into the colleges. We're going into the medical schools may even be too late. But we are trying to teach women that we want them as our participants in cardiology. Very good question. I wish I had a more favorable answer. One more question. Is it going to be a next mission? Beg pardon? Is it going to be a next mission? Campaign? Next campaign? Uh, it's, this is an ongoing campaign. There's a group within the American College of Cardiology called Women in Cardiology. There's a group within the American Heart Association called Women in Cardiology. And Dr. Lala and I are going to try to get information about this meeting to both of those groups, saying, look what India is doing, perhaps we need to copy. Dr. Pailajani, it is not only interventional cardiology, in politics also, women, Hillary Clinton nearly became president of the United States. So there is nothing like that. that Madam, what I want to ask you is that why females are developing more coronary artery disease? Are, are they giving more preference to their profession personal, than the personal life? They are getting married late. They are getting uh, children late, later in the age group, 30s and 40s. Do you think this is a risk factor for uh, coronary artery disease in women? We will be doing a lot, of, a lot more talking about risk factors on coronary disease in women. And I, actually, I'm going to address that in my lecture tomorrow, so let me wait. But one sentence summary. Women and men share many cardiovascular risk factors, but many of them disproportionately affect women. But there are risk factors unique to women, and that is what I hope the audience will take away back to their clinical practices. Insights from the world's best medical minds. You are watching the right doctors.com.